So, Minister, do you admit that the NHS is in crisis? Look, I'm not going to sit here and say that things couldn't be better in the NHS. It's undeniably under a lot of pressure, like Therese Coffey's blood. But that's why I believe in delivering on our five priorities for the country. Halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing debt, cutting waiting lists and stopping small boats. But is there a crisis? Crisis is a very big word. It's only six letters. You obviously studied maths to 18. Are you saying there isn't any problem at all? Look, I'm not going to sit here and tell you there isn't a problem. Well, I mean, you're welcome to stand. The cameras are adjustable. The point is that we've had a pandemic and there's nothing we could have done about that except deal with it better, but that had nothing to do with me. It wasn't eat out to help out your idea. Who knows where ideas really come from? But I believe in delivering on our five priorities for the country. Halving, growing, stopping, cutting and boats. Social care is of course a major part of the problem. How can you improve that when care workers are only paid £18,000 a year? Look, I want care workers to feel valued. By paying them more? More value doesn't necessarily equal more money. Did you study maths to 18? I talk to care workers all the time in my head and they tell me they want to be respected, professionalised and qualified, not paid more, which is lucky. Would you do a care worker's job for £18,000 a year? No, because I already have a job. But what if you didn't, say, after the next election? Look, people have different skills. Some people are skilled at caring, other people are skilled at not caring which is actually more lucrative. Are you registered with a private GP? Well, obviously I am, but I'm not going to admit that, am I? Why not? Because I have to pretend that we're all in this together. And because I believe in our five priorities, halving boats, cutting times, growing debts and reducing stops. Do you still believe in the monarchy? I do, and I believe that King Charles's coronation this year will do a huge amount of good. Because if watching a man chosen by a quirk of fate riding in a golden chariot to pick up a diamond encrusted hat during a cost of living crisis can't bring this country together, then I don't know what can. Last question, do you think the Conservative Party can survive? Yes, if we deliver on our priorities. Waiting, half cut, stopping growth on a small boat. Minister? Look, I'm not going to sit here anymore. Thank you, Minister. Next up, as Keir Starmer sets out his vision for Britain for what feels like the 50th time, we ask, is the country now ready to vote for Labour? Or do we need a few more relaunches just to be sure? Testing. One, two, one, two, one, two, three Prime Ministers in a year. Five pledges, five pledges, five pledges. Your priorities, your priorities. Boris Johnson is a pillock. Boris Johnson is a pillock. How's my hair? Do I look honest and trustworthy? More than the last two at least? It'll have to do. Prime Ministerial. Prime Ministerial. Hello, people of Britain. I am your Prime Minister. Still. I wanted to talk to you about my plans for the next year. Although I'm only looking as far as about June, which feels realistic. Let me be clear. I will only promise what I can deliver, and I will deliver what I promise. I'm like Amazon. Prime. I'm the Amazon Prime Minister, if you will, in that I'm extremely rich, I hate unions, and I just can't help putting small companies out of business. If I could sum up my agenda in just one word, it would be delivery. In two words, it would be deliver, delivery. In three words, yes, deliver, delivery. In four words, yes, deliver, delivery, please. You get the idea. And just like a delivery company, if things go wrong, we'll change the name at the top. Now, there has been some criticism of my decision to go to Leeds via private jet. As I said to Grant Shapps, I wish you could have airbrushed me out of that aeroplane. But look, my time as Prime Minister is precious. If travelling by air saves me a few minutes that I can spend making a trailer for my next video, then surely that's got to be worth a few tonnes of CO2. Anyway, I thought it'd be nice for the people of the North to see a private jet. That's not something they get to witness every day. Did someone say levelling up? Probably not me. And look, I understand why people might want me to use an NHS doctor instead of going private, but using the trains as well. What next? Do you want me to get on a bus? To iron my own ties? Be reasonable. The next year will be tough. For all of us. For me, mostly politically. For you, financially and existentially. So in many ways, I've got it worse. I have to go now. I've been trying so hard to look empathetic. I think I might have pulled a muscle in my face. Better go and ring Booper. I mean... That's fascinating, thank you. I have to say, you really seem to know what you're talking about. Thanks. And now we're going to hear from someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. Sorry, what? Yes, we're going over to someone who has absolutely no knowledge about this subject, but does have some pretty strong opinions. Why? Well, our research shows that most of our viewers don't know what they're talking about, so it's an important demographic for us. But then, isn't it your job to educate them? No, that's your job. We're not school. So you spoke to me for what? 
Three minutes. How long does the next person get? Half an hour. What? In fact, I think he's presenting this programme next week. Why? People really like his no-nonsense style. But if he doesn't know what he's talking about, surely it's all nonsense. He asks the questions that no one else will. Maybe because they're stupid questions? Is there really such a thing as a stupid question? Well, you've just asked one. Anyway, we really do have to go over to him now. Unless you'd like to stay on the line and have a debate about something I know a lot about, but he doesn't. Yeah, it should be easy for you to win then, shouldn't it? Will you be fact-checking us and ensuring that I get equal time to speak? In no way. I think I'll pass then. Now, I'm delighted to welcome to the show former Conservative, current MP and future TV presenter, Andrew Bridges. This week, the government announced plans to give police powers to stop protests before they even start. So, Commissioner, how would that work? Well, we all know the kind of people who like to make trouble. We'll just look out for the telltale signs. What sort of signs? You know, dreadlocks, veganism, social conscience quite opinionated on Twitter, that sort of thing. Do you not think you should be focusing on crimes that have actually happened, rather than trying to predict those that might happen in the future? We're a modern police force. We don't like to get hung up on the past, like lockdown breaching parties. Indeed, it's all very complicated. And you know what they say, prevention is better than cure. But apparently not when it comes to your own workforce. There have been a number of shocking incidents recently involving Met officers. Yes, and we're very sorry about that. We've let everyone down, especially women. Although, to be fair, there was very little we could have done to prevent it. Well, apart from listening to the numerous complaints made about them over many years and their widely known incriminating nicknames. Apart from that, yes. Actually, sorry, slight tangent, but don't you usually have epaulets on your shoulders? Oh, uh, yes, they've, uh, they've gone missing. <laughs> missing? Yes, last time I saw them was at the station. I think someone must have stolen them. Okay. But I'm sure I'll get them back soon. I've already spoken to Phil the Pickpocket, Klepto Keith and Fingers McGee. Are they your main suspects? No, the investigating officers. Right. Now, on a lighter note, I understand that the Met Police is now branching out into brewing, is that correct? Yes, well we deal with the effects of drinking every weekend, so we thought we'd better get involved in the supply side too. I'm delighted to announce the launch of LOLOLO Alcohol Cider. And you're closely involved in the process yourself. Yes, I look after the barrels of apples. Quality control, if you will. So what do you do when you find an apple that's rotten? I fish it out and carry on, because you know what they say, one bad apple gives you no information about the other apples in the barrel. Right. And how is the cider? Undrinkable. Thank you, Commissioner. Next up, as HMRC launches a campaign to warn people of the dangers of getting involved in tax avoidance, we ask, might it be a good idea for them to start with the Cabinet? Hello, barista individual. Please may I receive a cup of coffee like a normal human being, which is what I am? Sure. I'm Jeremy Hunt. You might know me as a two-time leadership loser and repeated Freudian slip, and yet somehow I'm now the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Funny how things turn out. Well, not funny, ha ha. While my coffee is being manufactured, <laughs> let me tell you about all of the mess we've made of the country. You might be thinking that things used to be sort of okay and now they're really bad. So how did we get here? Well, it really started with austerity. George Osborne's brilliant decision to tackle the global financial crisis by slashing investment, like a medieval doctor treating your flu by amputating your leg. Then Covid came along and we gave loads of money to our friends, allowed businesses to profiteer, let loads of people die and even more get sick, and after that there were supply chain issues, and not just with the PPE we ended up burning. And we can't forget Brexit, although like everyone else around here, I'm really trying to. I used to think it was a terrible idea, and now I pretend I think it's a good idea, but mostly I'm just going la la la. Then last year, Putin declared war on Ukraine, and Truss and Kwarteng declared war on the UK economy. What a pair of Jeremy's. So what am I going to do to halve inflation? Well, I'm going to wait a few weeks, because inflation is calculated over 12 months, and the big energy price spikes happened last year, so even if we do absolutely nothing, inflation is almost guaranteed to fall. But what that means is just that the rate at which you're getting poorer is slowing down. You're still getting poorer. So what are we doing about that? Well, we're engaging in culture war issues like trans rights and small boats in the hope that that will make you so angry you'll forget about the economy. We're investing in renewable resources like plinky plonky piano music that we can use in the background of all of our videos. And we're making the difficult decision to go to war with the unions in the hope that the public will start blaming people for asking for pay rises when households are facing the biggest dropping living standards since records began. But most of all, we're crossing our fingers really, really tightly in the hope that something turns up. That's the plan. Wish me luck. Although, you're the ones who'll need it. Mmm, cheers and cheers Rio. Is the garlic in this?
Are you a government minister who's been a little bit careless, but possibly not deliberately? Did you pretend to forget about that offshore trust, then threaten to sue anyone who reminded you? Or perhaps you gave up a cushy job in the city for the chance to make a real difference to your bank balance? Well, ignore those siren voices telling you you've done something wrong. Just close your eyes and repeat the golden rule. It's not corruption, if it's Britain. Exploiting a pandemic by helping your donors or leveraging your place in the House of Lords? It's not corruption if it's Britain. Taking money from the representatives of foreign governments and then just happening to do what they want? That's not corruption if it's Britain. Rewarding a friend and donor for helping you set up a loan with your cousin by giving him the top job at a much-loved institution? I mean, yes, that sounds bad, but corruption? In this country? Pfft, come on. Opponents not convinced put their minds at rest by launching an independent investigation run by a friend or a colleague or the father of a friend or colleague, or if you're really desperate, a colleague of your father's friend. But don't worry, they all went to Oxford, so you'll be fine. You say conflict of interest, I say synergy of influence. Because corruption is something that happens in other countries. Hot ones, probably. Can you really do dodgy deals in drizzle? And after all, politics is about helping people. And you're a person. Right? So, Minister, these strikes show no sign of ending. People across the public sector are saying that they just can't cope. What's your response? Well, can I say that I hear the strikers, I feel them, I can practically taste and smell them, and I absolutely understand what they're going through. Have you ever been on strike yourself? God, no. No. Uh, when I worked in the private sector, there was never any talk of industrial action. If I wasn't happy with my compensation, I'd simply demand a pay rise from my father, and if that didn't work, I'd get another job with my uncle. And since then, you've been an MP and minister. Yes, and imagine if we went on strike. The country would fall apart. Uh, and we have no job security. We can be kicked out of Parliament at any moment with nothing to show for it, except a generous pension. Sure, but if we want to make any more money, we're forced to go into the jungle. Are you talking about Matt Hancock? No, the City of London is an absolute bear pit. So you're telling teachers and nurses just to get another job? Why not? We're recruiting more people into schools and hospitals all the time. But you have huge numbers of vacancies. That's just because we're recruiting so many people. What? You know, it's like when you eat a big meal and you stretch your stomach so you can just about manage pudding. Uh, the more we recruit, the bigger the number of vacancies are. It, it, it's just basic maths. Can you offer any encouragement to the people striking at the moment? Look, I would love to give the nurses a pay rise. I would love that. In fact, it would make me feel all squishy inside. So why don't you? Because in the end, it's about making choices. Sometimes you have to make the tough, difficult, unpopular choices for 12 or 13 years. But if you give us another 12 or 13 years, eventually we'll be able to make popular choices. Why do you have to make these unpopular choices? Because we have to keep control of inflation. But isn't inflation mostly caused by global factors, including the profits of companies like Shell, who recently recorded their highest returns in over a century? Well, I... So could you not just tax their profits to pay nurses? Well, no, because that's their money. It's private money, good money. Whereas if we tax it, it turns into public money to pay people with, and that's bad money. The kind of money that causes inflation. Thank you, Minister. Next up, as the US tracks a suspected Chinese spy balloon across their skies, we ask which charmingly anachronistic technology do you think could lead to World War III? Hello, I, I'm the MP for Uxbridge, uh, and as such, my responsibilities include uh, uh, supporting my constituents, uh, uh, voting in Parliament, whatever, uh, but most of all, coming to America and talking about foreign affairs. Uh, don't worry, Carrie, it's not that kind of affair. <laughs> Although I have met some very attractive interns. You may remember that I used to be a Prime Minister, uh, and I was so good at it that my party let me have a little break uh, to go and uh, make some money and so forth, but now I'm back and raring to go. My trip here to Washington DC is all about Ukraine, spelt B-O-R-I-S. You know, at Eton, where I went, there used to be a little tradition where the younger boys would warm the toilet seats for the older boys. And can I just say that I think that Rishi is doing an excellent job in number 10. I've been amazed at how many people have been willing to meet me, although, to be honest, I think a lot of them don't really pay attention to what's happening in old Blighty, so they still think that I'm top dog. I mean, Kevin McCarthy called me Prime Minister at least once. <laughs> we commiserated about having difficult parties to deal with, you know. Uh, he, he moaned about MTG, I bitched about the ERG. You know, we bonded. I'm meeting lawmakers here on both sides of the aisle to reassure them that no matter how crazy politics gets over here, back in the UK, we'll definitely try our best to keep up. Now, speaking of crazy, I've been picking fights not just with Vladimir Putin, but also Tucker Carlson. Because you have to admit, I'm not as bad as those guys, right? But it hasn't all been work, you know. I, I, I like to make things in my spare time, as you may know. You know? I, I like to make uh, models of buses. Uh, I like to make uh, garages for little quad bikes. And uh, most of all, I like to uh, make things up. 
Putin's invasion of Ukraine is the defining moment for the world of the early 21st century. A bit like Brexit is the defining moment for Britain of the early 21st century. But of course, unlike Brexit, Putin's invasion of Ukraine was a result of nationalistic hubris and doomed to fail from the start. Uh, uh, vaccines! Undeterred by the precedent of the mini-budget, Rishi Sunak has just announced a mini-reshuffle. So, Minister, there are now four new government departments. That's right, you can't say that this government doesn't care about creating jobs, as long as they're for ministers. Exactly. What's the rationale behind these changes? Well, Rishi is absolutely committed to making the UK a science and technology superpower. And what does that mean? I've no idea, I've only been minister for five minutes, but I imagine it's something to do with massive test tubes in the colours of the Union Jack. The Prime Minister said he wants a government driven by innovation. What kind of innovation? Well, Rishi believes that in order for this country to thrive, we need new ideas. Such as? Uh, electric vehicles? So are you happy about the collapsed British vault factory, which has just been bought by an Australian company? Well, uh, we've also got a new chairman and deputy chair. Yes, Lee Anderson has just been appointed deputy chair of the party, despite his many controversial statements. Do you feel comfortable with him in that role? Yes, Lee is a decent, ordinary, normal, salt-of-the-earth man. He said that nurses who use food banks just don't know how to budget, and he boycotted the England football team for taking the knee. Look, Lee is simply saying all of the awful things that the normal, ordinary, decent, ordinary, normal, salt-of-the-earth, working-class, normal, ordinary, decent, normal people of the Red Wall think. Sorry, did you say awful things. Yes, these ordinary, decent, normal, ordinary, working class, salt of the earth, ordinary, normal, decent, ordinary, normal, ordinary, decent, ordinary people may have some awful opinions, but that doesn't mean that they don't deserve representation. Is that not a bit patronising to your own voters? Oh come on, there's no way that all of them are going to end up voting for us again, so we may as well have some culture war fun. Plus, you never know, some of us might end up presenting our own TV show. Some critics have described all of this as simply reshuffling deck chairs on the Titanic. In fact, that's actually an image that Lee Anderson himself used in a conservative WhatsApp group. Well, yes, and if he were on the Titanic, I imagine he'd call the iceberg woke, as well as being the first one in the lifeboats. Thank you, Minister. Next up, as Liz Truss returns to public life with a 4,000-word essay that blames everything that went wrong in her Mayfly government on somebody else, we ask, why do the wrong people get imposter syndrome? Hello, prospective voters. You may not be aware, because we've been trying to keep it pretty quiet, that from now on you'll need photo ID to be able to vote. We think that it's vitally important that the only people who vote are the people that we think are supposed to. Because we all know that there's the potential for absolutely massive voter fraud at any time. The fact that there hasn't really been any up until now simply means that we have to be extra vigilant. That's why we're spending millions of pounds to fix this. I mean, just because you live in a low crime area doesn't mean that you shouldn't also hire armed guards to patrol your garden. That will definitely deter burglars. And as a bonus, most other visitors. So what kind of photo ID do you need? Well, if you have a passport or a driving license, you're good to go. But can you remember where you put your passport? If you live in rented accommodation or have young children or read The Guardian, it'll probably take ages to find. In which case, why not simply sack off this boring election malarkey and go and post a hashtag on TwitTok or watch an episode of Sex Island or whatever it is you people do. We are aware that not everybody who wants to vote will have a passport or a driving licence, especially some of the older members of the community, sometimes known as our demographic. So never fear, at polling stations they will also accept an older person's bus pass, a senior smart card, a freedom pass, a National Trust membership card, or a voucher from Saga Holidays. They will not accept a young person's rail card, student ID, or a Sam Smith fan club badge, if such a thing exists. If you don't already have the requisite ID, then you can apply for a special voting ID from your local council. But let's face it, you probably won't. I mean, if you can't be bothered to learn how to drive, you're hardly going to be bothered to learn how to vote, are you? And local councils are a nightmare. I mean, have you seen the state of those roads? Plus, we're not exactly shouting this from the rooftops, are we? I mean, did you know you needed photo ID to vote before the start of this video? And that's fine by us, because we want everybody to have the right to vote, but we really only want the right to vote. So my advice would be, just stay at home and carry on enjoying or enduring your lives and we'll carry on making the right decisions for you. At a speech in Manchester today, Keir Starmer unveiled his five missions for a better Britain. Our pledges, missions and ambitions correspondent Jonathan Goodenough has more. Yes, that's right. The leader of the Labour Party made it very clear that he has a number of missions for this country. And that number is five. So what are they? Well, they start with mission one, as you might expect, then go on to mission two, uh, then jump forward to mission five before jumping back to mission four and then finishing on mission 
three. Uh, although that might be because just before I came on air, I did drop my notes. Are these missions difficult? <laughs> Unlike Tom Cruise, I'm sure that Sir Keir will hope that these aren't missions impossible. <laughs> Although Tom's up to about seven now, isn't he? So can you just run through them for us? Okay, yeah, let me just check my notes. Um, right, something about growth and the NHS, generally pro, uh, crime, generally against, uh, uh, halve inflation, uh, stop the small boats. Oh, no, sorry, I think I've got those mixed up with Rishi Sunak's five pledges, right? Okay, just replace small boats with clean energy and you get the gist. In fact, actually, was that one of Sunak's policies? Why do politicians these days seem obsessed with setting out their plans in fives? From Tony Blair's five pledges to now it's always five. Well, according to my sources, it's because five is the smallest number that sounds like a lot, but the largest number that feels achievable. What does that mean? Well, for example, if I say I'm going to drink five pints over an evening, that sounds reasonable. Uh, four, I feel like a lightweight. Six, an alcoholic. And that's the same for politics. Yes, and it also means you can count the pledges off with one hand, which is an effective rhetorical device and a useful aid memoir. But this can backfire if you can't recall them all in public. Yes, that's right. You might remember Rick Perry's unfortunate oops moment when he couldn't remember one of his pledges in a live Republican primary debate. And that was one of only three, wasn't it? Yes, American attention spans are shorter. So how much will Starmer's five missions impact on the election? Well, he's already 20 points ahead in the polls, so unless one of his missions was to hand every asylum seeker a golden key that gives them access to the single market and all women's bathrooms, then probably not much. And is that one of his missions? According to the Daily Telegraph, yes. Thank you, Jonathan. Next up, as supermarkets start to ration salad vegetables, we'll speak to the Secretary of State for DEFRA, who'll give us some great tips on new recipes, such as the 2023 BLT, made from a blue passport, leaves and turnip. So you might say that the Northern Ireland Protocol has transitioned into the Windsor framework. I thought you weren't that keen on things changing their identity. Look, I'm just glad that we can finally put behind us all of the rancour and confusion and populism that we've suffered. By suffered, do you mean caused? Yes, I can't tell you how much I've hated myself over the last few years. There have been days I've looked in the mirror and thought, why are you being so awful, you awful, awful man? But it's on days like this that I realise it's all been worth it. What has? I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that today is the greatest day in our proud nation's history. We've finally taken back control. Can I just be clear? You voted for the Northern Ireland Protocol in the first place. Yes. And at the time you said it was a fantastic deal and that we'd finally taken back control. That's right. And yet now you're saying that that deal was actually terrible, but the deal we have now is fantastic and it means we've finally taken back control. Got it in one. So why should people believe you this time? Because this time we've got get Brexit done, done. Even though you said you got Brexit done before. Yes, but back then we'd only got Brexit done. This time we've got it done, done. And you're not going to come back in a year's time and say that we need to get it done, done, done? Well, I can't promise that, not least because done, done, done sounds like something from a horror film, which is pretty cool. So what's good about this deal? Well, it's great for Northern Ireland. Their goods will have free access to the single market and the British market. <laughs> the rest of the UK could only dream of that. They didn't need to before Brexit. But they won't have to abide by European rules. For example, the EU recently banned titanium dioxide in cakes. Whereas everyone in the UK, including Northern Ireland, will still be able to enjoy a sweet treat with as much food whitener in it as they like. Wasn't that banned because it might be carcinogenic? That's a small price to pay for more whiteness. That sounds like one of my election slogans. The DUP still don't seem very happy. When do they ever? They like to say no more than every woman I've ever spoken to in a bar. But just for them, we've negotiated the Stormont break. What's the Stormont break? Something that reminds me of a romantic trip I made to Belfast in the early 90s. I misread an offer on Teletext holidays and ended up on a very tense weekend. Thank you, Minister. Next up, as the price of eggs continues to rocket and tomatoes are hard to find, we ask would now be a good time for the government to call a snap election, as there's less produce around to pelt them with. As a fellow uh, talented, blonde-haired troublemaker once rapped, uh, uh, guess who's back? Uh, back again. This morning I was, I was on a run in the park and there was a fit young geezer who ran past me, uh, bald as well, uh, looked not unlike one of my former advisors. Uh, although fit and young, uh, uh, and he greeted me with a cheery London greeting of uh, wanga. <laughs> and at first I was like, oh no, very rude, yeah, you rotter. Yeah. Uh, but then I thought, no, actually, what a wonderful country we live in. You know, what a privilege to live in such a place where the distance between the, the, the government 
and the governed is, is so small, you know, sometimes just a matter of a, a few million pounds in the bank. I mean, imagine that happening in Russia with Putin. I, 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 we should think ourselves very, very, very lucky, very happy that we live in a country where, where journalists are not shot for simply criticising politicians. Uh, but some politicians do arrange to have journalists beaten up. I, I mean, we live in a country where the Prime Minister can be fined for eating lunch. <laughs> I still don't really understand what happened there. And people tell me there was a pandemic happening at the time. But, you know, where's the evidence you know, that wasn't collected by a Labour spy? Can I just say that when I stepped down, uh, we, were, we were only a handful of points behind Labour. Uh, uh, Eleven. Uh, which I do consider to be a handful, in the same way that I have a handful of children. With Brexit, people voted for freedom. The freedom to live as they like, without fruit and vegetables. I, I, I have to admit it was my fault uh, for trusting the EU not to implement the agreement that we had signed. I mean, talk about wankers. Uh, I mean, I, for goodness sake, I, I, I've never signed anything I haven't intended to break. You know, I've been married three times, for God's sake. Do you know, Angela Merkel came up to me at a summit and said, you know, if you carry on with this protocol bill, it will be a Shakespearean tragedy. Uh, I'll let you decide which one. I mean, obviously, I'm Julius Caesar. You know, et tu, Rishi. You know. uh, and of course, we all now think, you know, Matt Hancock, bottom. Look, this government is nothing without Brexit. And by Brexit, I do, of course, mean me. Now, you may say that threatening and goading the EU didn't work and respectful negotiations did. But no, I say that we just didn't threaten and goad enough. One more round of shouting uh, and they'd have thrown in Gibraltar for free. Now, look, I recognise that some people in this audience may not agree that Brexit was a good idea. Uh, raise your hand if you think it was. I demand a people's vote. Welcome to TBC News. Our main story today, the government has announced plans to feed kittens into meat grinders. It's a controversial move. Yes, that's right. The government claims that there are just too many young cats and they believe... Sorry, I have to interrupt you there. I've got some breaking news. A TBC sports presenter has tweeted that this is the kind of thing that might happen in a horror film. Really? Wow, comparing government proposals to a horror film, what was he thinking? Let's go over to a government spokesman. Well, this is absolutely typical of the TBC, full of lefty, liberal, wokey, liberal, virtue signalling, left-leaning, wokey warriors. Um, besides, the only horror film I've ever seen is The Exorcist, and there are no kittens in that. So you think he was wrong to tweet that? Yes, and he's way out of line on public opinion on this, because the public voted very clearly to feed kittens into meat grinders. To be fair, it was quite a close vote to adopt a new approach to dealing with animals in general. We know what they meant. So do you think that this presenter should get a red card? Yes, or a black eye. What? I don't really understand sport, apart from shooting. Let's talk to the opposition now. What do you think about what this presenter tweeted? Well, look, I think that comparing anything to a horror film is just inappropriate. Even feeding kittens into a meat grinder. Are you saying that you would do that too? No, we wouldn't do that. Because it just wouldn't work. The fur would jam up the blades. We'd find a more humane way to do it. We wanted to speak to a TBC spokesman about this, but I'm afraid no one from TBC was available to speak to us here at TBC News. So instead, we're now speaking to a former TBC presenter who now works for a commercial rival and the government part-time and has said repeatedly that he thinks that TBC should be shut down, despite the fact that he appears on TBC's Asking Questions pretty much every week. We should put that sports presenter into a meat grinder, along with everyone else who works at the TBC. Is that a reasonable response? You make a strong case. Now, we were going to go to sports at this point, but the only sports story today is why did a sports presenter have an opinion? Yes, that's right. The world of sport has really been knocked off its axis. We may as well cancel the FA Cup. I mean, what's the point anymore? Next up, much more on this story. So I'm afraid we won't have time to discuss further government plans to bludgeon puppies with a bat or give a supportive newspaper editor a peerage. The most important thing happening in the next tax year, which I definitely won't mention in this speech, is the freezing of income tax thresholds, which is an effective tax increase which will cost most people way more than all of the giveaways I mentioned today. The theme of today's budget can be summed up by the four E's. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Last year, the OBR forecast that this year we would be in a recession. But I can now reveal that this year we will not be in a recession. Technically. Which is technically a good thing. Just like Diet Pepsi is technically a drink. I'm going to bask in the positivity of the OBR report and let you find out for yourselves later that it also says that real disposable incomes will fall by more than 5% for the next two years. The largest two-year fall since records began. But oh, look over there. I'm reducing the price of a pint. We're reducing the duties on draft beer by 11p per pint. So when you get told how much your drink is, you'll still say, what? 
but slightly less incredulously than before. I'm calling it the Brexit pub guarantee, because it doesn't matter which pub you go into, you're guaranteed to find someone at the bar who still thinks that Brexit was a good idea. Uh, Brexit pub guarantee is also my nickname for Nigel Farage. So to the next E, E inflation, which is forecast to drop from 10.7% today to 2.9% by the end of this year, a triumph for this government. And we've achieved this by watching wholesale gas prices fall and not paying the public sector very much. I mean, that wasn't necessary, just a bit of a bonus. We're also introducing apprenticeships for older people called returnships, where you'll be able to learn crucial skills for the modern workplace, like what is a TikTok and how to keep your WhatsApps private, Matt. The final E is childcare. E childcare, which doesn't mean we're trying to get robots to look after our kids. Although I'm offering a million pounds a year to anyone who can make that happen. Childcare is far too expensive. So we are going to offer free childcare for all children under two in two years time. So it will only really affect children who are yet to be born. So get shagging, not you Boris. Here at TTV News TV, we've been accused of being too close to the government by employing Conservative MPs to interview ministers. But we think, well, who knows more about the inner workings of government than a member of parliament? Isn't that right, Geoffrey? Very well put. Now today, I'm interviewing the finance minister about the budget. So, minister, how do you think it went? Well, I thought it was a triumph. In what ways? Well, it was very good for very rich people, of course, but it was also quite good for quite rich people. On behalf of our viewers and owners, thank you. You're very welcome. Now, when you were interviewed on the BBC earlier today, you were challenged quite strongly about the effects on the economy of Brexit. I certainly was. Well, I suppose I also have to ask you the big question. How did that make you feel? Honestly, I felt hurt and embarrassed. And you've worked with Boris Johnson, so you know what that's like. Exactly. Now, the other big question. Did you get to have a go holding the red box? I mean, uh, did you get to have a go holding the red box? Um, yes, I, uh, yeah, yes. I, uh, um, I think that's probably enough. Uh, thank you, Geoffrey. I mean, Minister. No, uh, thank you, Minister. Je Geoffrey. Minister Geoffrey. Thank you, Geoffrey. After the break, we'll be discussing the illegal migration bill with a balanced panel of a people trafficker, an angry man who hates refugees, and a columnist who argues that the Nazis were actually left wing. And later, I'll be travelling to Africa with the Home Secretary and reporting on how brilliant her Rwanda scheme is because I'm very excited to go in a helicopter painted with the Union Jack. But before that, the weather. Floods of migrants on the south coast. One photo from the Home Secretary's trip to Rwanda this week is causing controversy. That photo was doctored. In what way? It cropped out the other people the Home Secretary was sharing a joke with. Can you share it with us? No, because we're still before the watershed. Is laughter not a bit insensitive? No, she's one step closer to achieving her dream of seeing migrants being flown to Rwanda. She deserves a bit of a chuckle. Is there not a contradiction at the heart of this plan? In what sense? Well, you're telling people that if they try and claim asylum in the UK, they'll be deported to Rwanda. Yes, if people are people trafficked here, then we'll punish the people traffickers by people trafficking the trafficked people somewhere else. And yet, Suella Braverman made great play of how nice the homes in Rwanda were. She even complimented the decor. Well, you should see the wallpaper in her office. She ended up with all the scraps Boris got rid of from number 10. I mean, anything's better than Theresa May's taste. So is Rwanda meant to be a deterrent or not. Yes, a lovely deterrent. We're saying to people that if they try and come here, then we'll send them to some lovely homes over there instead. So you're threatening them with a nice time. No, it's a deterrent, but a pleasant one. A pleterrent. Are you sure it's pleasant? A report published only this week is very critical of Rwanda's human rights record. For example, it says, and I quote, conditions are generally harsh and life-threatening in unofficial or intelligence service-related detention centres. Ugh, who wrote that? No doubt some lefty liberal wokies from Amnesty International. That was the US State Department. And we take what our friends and allies say very seriously, which is why we want to make it clear that we don't want to send anybody to Rwanda. You just said it was pleasant. None of this makes any sense. It's not supposed to make sense, is it? It's supposed to make people on both sides angry. What? Yes, our side gets to think that we're being tough, but when it inevitably gets struck down by the lords or the courts on human rights grounds, we can say, well, we tried to do something, but those pesky judges wouldn't let us. Right. And all the lefty lawyer types get very publicly het up about it too, which helps us out because, well, our voters find them very annoying anyway. So you're saying it's all a publicity stunt. Suella Braverman doesn't really want to send refugees to Rwanda. 
Oh, no, I'm pretty sure she does. So hang on, is she a true believer in this plan, or is she a cynical politician using it to whip up division? Why not both? Thank you, Minister. Next up, as another damning report is published into the Metropolitan Police, we ask how many bad apples would you have to find in a barrel before starting again with a fresh barrel? And would you trust Swella Bravman to be involved in selecting the new apples? The whole truth and uh, nothing but the truth has assured by my advisers, so help me God. Can I start by saying to the committee, with the greatest of respect, who are you? I haven't heard of any of you, uh, apart from Harriet Chairman, just because she's a woman. Uh, I mean, I've been on Have I Got News for you, for God's sake. I am taking this hearing very seriously, so much so I've even brushed my hair. The only person who disagrees with me is Dominic Cummings, and he has many reasons to lie. Unlike me, who lies for no reason. Would we really have invited the official photographer along if we thought we were doing anything wrong? I mean, do you think we are that stupid and brazen? <laughs> Yes, I am the guy who rode around in a lying bus. You say it should have been obvious, but, you know, what does obvious mean? I mean, for a lot of people, it's obvious that I'm awful. But people keep voting for me and marrying me, so, you know, riddle me that. People in number 10 were making an effort to socially distance. That's why we drank champagne, you know? You don't have to pour it, you can just shake it up and spray it. You know, it goes at least two metres. We followed the guidance to the best of our ability. And our ability was low. No one told me it was wrong. You know, I was the leader, so they took their lead from me, which was their mistake. Number 10 is a uniquely difficult place to socially distance. Yeah? It's an 18th century townhouse filled with narrow corridors and people who don't give a toss. Nowhere else in the country was as difficult to work as number 10. I mean, imagine having your worst enemy living just next door. I believed that these events were not just reasonably necessary, but essential for work purposes. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I don't attend at least one leaving do per week, well, my efficiency rate just goes right down. I was not partying during lockdown. I was thanking staff who happened to be having a party at the time. It's very different. No, I'm not angry. You're angry. Right, well, time to lead a great rebellion against Rishi. No, 29 votes is quite a lot. It's more than I get in a by-election these days anyway. Stop calling it a party. I never called it a party. Except when I called it a party, it was shorthand because the press were calling the party a party. Is that clear? I won't use the names of any of the officials involved. Jack, Mary, Eric, Graham and Jenny are just some of the names I won't use. We all remember the guidance that I gave very clearly. Hands, face, space. Brackets, wherever possible. Footnote, if you can be bothered. It's not my fault if you didn't read the full advice. I may have made some remarks about the social distancing. Those remarks were not necessarily meant to be a joke. Uh, I have in the past said some things that were not intended to be funny. The evidence of that is not in the bundle. I did see trestle tables. Uh, I, I don't remember what was on the trestle tables, uh, apart from some of the staff later on. Look, you can't expect some sort of electrified force field around people. You know, sometimes people will sort of drift into each other and then they will you know, possibly touch each other and then maybe start kissing each other. And, Sorry, where was I? We used a lot of mitigations, like uh, alcohol, uh, but based hand sanitizer. I think we used the cheap Prosecco for that. We didn't touch each other's pens. That might be a typo. I thought I was working because I was at my desk, and thanking people is very much my job. You know, remember Churchill's great speech, you know, we will thank them on the beaches. I think this is a great committee, and uh, I think this conversation has been very useful. Unless you find me guilty, in which case I reserve the right to call you a kangaroo court on a witch hunt. What would a kangaroo witch look like? Focus, Boris. I, I think the main thing we've learned today is that I'm really good at leaving dues. Will you all come to mine? So, Minister, you're here to talk about antisocial behaviour. But enough about the lockdown parties in Downing Street. Tell us about your plans to ban nitrous oxide. Well, it's an absolute menace. Little silver bottles strewn all around my local park. First time I saw them, I was worried it was spent ammunition. Thought I'd just missed a drive-by. Where exactly do you live? Sorry, Heath. Are there many drive-bys there? There's a first time for everything. And it's also littering. You know, I, I mean, I gathered them up and I didn't know which recycling to put them in. Eventually, I chose my neighbour's food bin. He votes Labour. Your own drugs advisory panel has said that nitrous oxide should not be banned. Yes, but they're a drugs panel, probably whacked out on speed. But why do you want to ban it? Well, for one thing, it makes young people laugh, and our voters don't want to see that. OK. If young people want to laugh, they should listen to some Radio 4 like the rest of us. Oh? What's your favourite comedy on there? Last word. The obituary programme. Yes. What is your problem with young people? Well, look, they just loiter all over the place, uh, hanging around in public parks with their good skin and working joints. It's very intimidating for anyone with a pension plan. Aren't public parks for hanging around in? No, they're for meeting journalists or mistresses, or walking your dog, or pushing a pram, if you're not a single mother. So what should young people do instead? Stay indoors playing video games? God, no, we have to tackle childhood obesity. So where should they go? Doorways? Corridors? 
Or maybe they should just go for a walk, like a march against climate change? Not that kind of walk. Now, you've been accused of being a hypocrite because you've admitted taking drugs in the past. Ah, but I didn't take nitrous, did I? I, I was on pure cocaine, which was, I believe, fair trade, as well as being reassuringly expensive. It's still an illegal drug. But the point is that I did it inside, and I didn't cause a nuisance. Apart from helping to run the Leave campaign. But old people loved that, and it turned out fine. Isn't the problem with all of these policies that making something illegal doesn't make people stop wanting to do it? I mean, many crimes are barely investigated by the police these days, as it is. How will giving them more to do help? Oh, we don't want to do anything, we just want to annoy lefties and look tough. Uh, but yes, if a few young people get criminal records that blight their whole lives for no good reason, well, that's just a bonus. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to dash. I'm meeting some old friends at the pub and we're going to get wasted. Thank you, Minister. Next up, as the government announces plans to fine people up to £1,000 for begging, we speak to an ex-cabinet minister who says that sounds reasonable to him, because that's his fee for just over an hour's work. So, Minister, tell us about this new deal you've just negotiated. Yes, I'm delighted to announce that the UK will soon be a member of the CPTPP. And that stands for the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yes, the CTPTP is a great opportunity for this country to join a vibrant trading bloc just a few thousand miles away. What is the benefit of joining this compared to being in the EU? Well, for one thing, it doesn't involve the French. Government figures suggest that joining this bloc will increase the UK's GDP by around 0.08% whereas the effects of Brexit are estimated at around minus 4%. Will you please stop going on about Brexit? It's embarrassing. We've left the EU and now we're committing to the CBGBs. I mean, for goodness sake, it's like being at a wedding with somebody who can't stop going on about the ex-wife. But you have to admit that those numbers are pretty stark. Look, 0.08% is an old number. It's from a prediction made years ago. So what is the new number? That's relevant. The point is that it could be potentially anything. All we have to do is believe hard enough. So you're not saying that this makes up for Brexit. We have to accept that Brexit is in the past. It's part of our history, which means we should build a statue of it, then forget it ever happened. Indeed, some people are saying that this deal could actually prevent the UK from ever getting back into the EU. I'm not saying that's why we're doing it, but it's not not why we're doing it, let's put it like that. But if we left the EU, surely at some point in the future we could just leave this. Well, not without a referendum, and no one wants another one of those. So why aren't we having a referendum on this deal? Sorry, what? If it's such a big deal, why don't the people get to vote? The difference is that this deal won't affect immigration, so there's no way to make any campaign about that. So what's the point? This deal only involves 11 countries, doesn't it? Yes, but that's the beauty of C3PO. Other countries will be joining after us. Uh, think of it like a startup. They're Facebook and we're Justin Timberlake, coming along at just the right moment to save everybody. I'm not sure that's actually what And happened. then they'll probably be so grateful that we arrived that they'll appoint us as the king of the CBGBs and we'll have a sort of empire back at last. Minister? Maybe they'll put up a statue of me. Thank you, Minister. Next up, as Donald Trump becomes the first former president to be charged with a crime, we ask, is this the first instance in recorded history of a witch hunt finding an actual witch? And later we'll be speaking to an American commentator who'll say that this will simply increase his appeal among Republican voters, because they love a bad boy, and in the end, they just want to be hurt. Are you bored of going on the same holidays year after year? Fancy something different for the Easter break? Planning a school trip and want the kids to have the time of their lives? Then why not try Brexit coach holidays? Because we all know that getting there is half of the fun of any holiday. And now you can make it half of the duration too. And with Brexit coach holidays, you'll get to revel in the best bit of any journey. Waiting in a car park at Dover. Luxuriate in your own choice of seating. Do you perch at the front like a goody two-shoes? Or join the bad boys at the back of the bus? Marvel at the huge range of snacks that your mother has packed for you, I hope, because there's nothing available on board. Hold your breath as your phone battery ticks down with no way of charging it. And of course also hold your breath if you're sat anywhere near the toilet. We all know us Brits love OQ, but if you're lacking motivation, simply imagine there's a dead queen at the end of it, and you'll be delighted to wait. As long as no celebrities try and push in, and don't worry, they definitely won't. As you sit for hour after hour, you'll have plenty of time to gaze in wonder at your lovely blue passport. Ample compensation for your tarmac time. Is a little stamp in a book really worth a 12 hour wait? Well, you wouldn't ask that about a penny black. Because remember, Brexit coach holidays are only possible because of Brexit, but they also have nothing to do with Brexit. Clear? It's a conundrum you'll have plenty of time to ponder. So enjoy your lay-by layoff a few hours in France, and then come back across the channel in a small boat, and you'll be sent straight to the Ritz, no doubt. Brexit coach holidays, because it's what you wanted, and you're going to blimmin' well enjoy it. 
The largest NHS strike in years continues this week. So, Mr. Junior Doctor, it's just Doctor. Mr. Junior Doctor, do you enjoy watching people die? What? Well, by striking, you're probably killing people. Do you get off on that? No, of course not. We're actually doing this to save the NHS. Suppose somebody dies this week because of a missed appointment. You're basically smashing their head in with a hammer, aren't you? I don't think that's fair. But you think a 35% pay rise is fair? Well, it's not really a pay rise. It's more restoring the pay to levels it should have been. But... I thought being a doctor was a vocation. Well, it is. In fact, it's a vocation and a privilege, but... And yet you want to be paid for your privilege. Isn't that a bit gauche? Look, if the government doesn't start paying junior doctors properly, they'll all keep leaving for places they can get a better quality of life, like Australia. A better quality of life? Have you seen the spiders in Australia? At least I'd be able to get an appointment with somebody who could treat me for the bites. We hear this week that one of the leaders of the strike action is actually on annual leave this week to attend a friend's wedding. Are you saying that doctors shouldn't be allowed time off? If you really believed in saving lives, you'd never go to sleep, let alone on holiday. When do you think these strikes will end? You need to talk to the government about that. Well, we did ask to speak to a minister about this, but no one was available. Typical. So instead, we sent our prettiest undercover reporter to pretend to be from a pharmaceuticals company and speak to them on the promise that they'd get £10,000 for an hour of their time. You're not recording this, are you? Huh? I have been caught out before. Kind of make it clear, I would never break the rules. Just have to check what the rules are first. Yeah. And is this against the rules? No? I'll take your word for it. You're sure you're not recording this? Yeah, some companies are cute with hospitality. They keep everything under £300. So, like, you could take me out to a restaurant, but as long as it doesn't cost more than £300, I don't have to declare it. What, my dinner of choice? Uh, I'd probably say a McDonald's meal deal and £290 in cash. Junior doctors? <laughs> a bit like junior ministers. Nobody cares until someone dies. Now, I don't think we're exploiting their good nature. No, they're just not motivated by money in the same way. You know, unlike, you know, bankers or Tory MPs, who absolutely have to be paid a lot of money because we know what we're doing is morally wrong. Yeah, I'd be happy to ask a question in the house for you. Uh, just don't fill it with jargon, you know. I'm only the health minister. I'm not actually medically qualified. Thank God. All of that debt and training, some mugs going. More on that story later when the minister discusses the current cabinet with some surprising results. Uh, kill, 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 snog, uh, snog, marry, then kill. Already snogged, so kill. The British farming industry has struggled in recent years, with Brexit, energy prices and climate change all taking their toll. But there's another kind of agriculture that is thriving. Rage farming. Our Making People Angry on the Internet correspondent, Jonathan Goodenough, has more. Yes, that's right. In a world of division and polarisation, some political figures have found a great way of driving engagement online. Provoke sheer anger and outrage. So how does it work? Well, say you're the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party and you haven't had enough attention recently. You simply tweet about going on holiday in the UK and imply that anyone travelling abroad is somehow unpatriotic. Right? Then sit back and enjoy as people queue up to tell you you're being ridiculous, thereby driving engagement and increasing your reach. OK, but you still come across like an idiot. An idiot with lots of engagement. Is it only the Conservatives who do this? Not at all. If you're Labour, you can share a graphic of the Prime Minister which picks on one of the few things he's not personally responsible for getting wrong, then pat yourselves on the back as it gets thousands of shares from people telling you they're disgusted. So they're literally farming outrage. Yes, fury, irritation and astonishment are all being cultivated on a massive scale. And how does this help? Sorry? Who is this helping? They're getting a lot of engagement. From people who are angry at them. Well, there's no such thing as bad publicity. But as a type of farming, does it nourish or feed anything? The never-ending ravening more of the 24-hour attention economy? Is this only for politicians? Not at all. That's the great thing about rage farming. It's available to anyone with a social media account, a dream, and absolutely no sense of shame or embarrassment. It's easy. How? Well, you could start by claiming that a classic, much-loved film is rubbish, or that sport is only for kids. I mean, but for best results, simply make up something about a country or a group of people and present it as fact. For example, Americans have never heard of kettles, women can't ride bicycles, or Europeans don't eat lunch. Are those real things people have said? They certainly are. That's absolutely ridiculous. Where's my phone? I need to correct them. Let the harvest begin. Thank you, Jonathan. Next up, as former quantum prime minister Liz Truss blames high tax rates on wokeness, we ask, are pride flags really that expensive? And when was the last time you blamed all your failures on a vague concept you can't define? Are you a government minister who wants to appeal to a very specific demographic? Do you need to establish your credentials as hard-hitting, no-nonsense, slash hard-hearted, no-conscience? Are your arguments about immigration just not cutting through? Then you need dog whistles and more. From fear flutes to outrage oboes, our extensive collection of coded language wind instruments can stimulate even the hardest to reach voters and smack them right in the fields. From the classic dog whistle 
these people just don't share our values and lifestyles. To the euphemism, euphonium, they settle in hyper-diverse areas and undermine cultural cohesiveness. All the way up to a full-scale bigot hall. A flood of illegal migrants threatens to cannibalise our compassion. Because we all know that protests whipped up by the far right are a warning. That if we don't pander to them, they might not vote for us at the next election. And we can't afford to lose their support on top of everyone else's. But that's not all. For a limited time only, get a bonus They're All Criminals pack for the low, low price of just a small portion of your soul. Spice up your arguments with some law lies. They're coming here illegally, so that makes them criminals. Chuck in a Kafka loop. They're the victims of criminal exploitation, which makes them criminals. Then deliver death by anecdote. There may be no evidence for higher crime rates amongst migrants, but a policeman told me that in private, and I know who I trust. Dog whistles and more. Because sometimes just a hint of authoritarianism is not quite enough. And why try and fix a problem when leaving it broken gives you more opportunities to blow that horn? It's an invasion! Warning, deploy sparingly. Overuse can reduce effectiveness and make stronger measures necessary, which may require armbands. Look, can I make it absolutely clear that I would not recommend stabbing you in the leg? Uh, in fact, if you remember, I actually argued very strongly against that particular course of action. However, now somebody has actually done that, I think it's very important that we leave time for the knife to bed in before we can judge just how bad things are. In fact, it might turn out to be useful. Every so often, we can give it a twist. Remember, I did try to warn you that cancelling your gym membership and cutting all fresh fruit and vegetables out of your diet was a bad idea. But now that you've done that, I have to respect your decision. No, I won't be trying to persuade you to rejoin the gym or, or try a carrot. That would be re-litigating the past. What we have to do is focus on the future and make a great success of you in your declining physical condition. Yes, I'll admit that when I joined this team, I did promise that you'd be able to see me whenever you liked and that all of my appointments would be free of charge. But I'm afraid that things have changed since then and so have my promises. But I'm confident that you'll still come and see me, because who else are you going to go and see? That bloke down the road who sells crystals, or your previous doctor who, let's not forget, actually stabbed you in the leg. Come on. I'm your only option, so I'll have to do. Friends, colleagues, Comrades. And yes, we are comrades, not because we're communists. In fact, we're the opposite of communists. We're national social uh, conservatives. I don't know about you, but when I look at all of the problems facing this country, I think what this place needs is more conservative conferences. You know, this is my second this week. You know, I feel like I'm at Glastonbury in that nobody here should be allowed anywhere near power. Do you know what this country needs? More babies. We desperately need more babies, otherwise our current young people will turn this place into a cultural, Marxist, wokist utopia. Yes, yeah, so we need an army of conservative babies to fight back. In between naps. I'm still working out the details. Our young people need to feel that they have a place in this country. Because after Brexit, we've made absolutely sure that they have no place in any other country. There is no reason we can't use the education system to build a high skills, high wage economy and also train more fruit pickers. Uh, lesson one, how to get a job with Apple. Lesson two, how to pick one. Just like our feckless children, the electorate has become fat, unhealthy and unruly. And just like our children, we need to slim it down and knock it into shape and then send it to boarding school. If we don't get our way, then socialists will force the United Kingdom into Great Britain and Great Britain into Ireland, uh, and then we'll have to show our penises to women at the border. I've spoken to Margaret Thatcher, and she approves of this conference. I've spoken to Queen Victoria, and she approves of this conference. I then spoke to Jack the Ripper and Dua Lipa, and they both approve of this conference. But at that point, I was asked to leave Madame Tussauds. We should all take inspiration from my favourite line from Gladiator. At my signal, unleash hell. There's nothing wrong with nationalism per se. Just because Germany mucked it up a couple of times doesn't mean we shouldn't love our country. Look, uniforms with armbands are practical. And there should be some way of distinguishing between good people and undesirables. 
some sort of patch? We hear a lot about minority rights, but what about majority rights? rights? Can I just say a big thank you to everyone who's made it possible for me to be here today? My parents, my friends, and above all the far-right Christian fundamentalist group who've paid for everything. Do you have a question about the summit? No, I haven't heard that story, but, but I'm afraid I'm focusing on my goals for this trip, which include uh, strengthening the relation. Of course, I'm aware of the story, but I haven't spoken to the minister about it yet. I'm focused on building our relation. Look, this really isn't a big story. The minister has put out a statement saying that nothing untoward has happened, and I think that should put an end to it. Now, if we can just... No, there's no need for any investigation or inquiry. The minister was very clear that nothing untoward has happened, and I believe them. For goodness sake, normal people don't care about this. It's a very minor story, and it's simply not coming up on the doorstep. Can I just say that I have full confidence in the minister, and no further action is required. This case is closed. The investigation will be carried out by my ethics advisor, who will report back to me within a few days with his preliminary findings. Look, of course you wouldn't expect me to comment on an investigation whilst it's ongoing. Uh, let's just wait for the results of the investigation. Now, if you'll excuse me. Yes, of course I regret the fact that my ethics advisor appears to have been involved in the original story and has had to be replaced. But this does not diminish the confidence that I have in the process or my minister. No further action is required. The judge-led public inquiry will focus on three main areas. What happened, who knew, and why they tried to cover it up. Uh, we expect the inquiry to interview at least two dozen witnesses over the next 12 to 18 months and cost at least £1.5 million. Seriously guys, please can we talk about anything else? Having seen an early draft of the report, I think it's fair to say that it's not as bad as people were suggesting it would be, and I think we should all be content now to move on and allow the minister and the rest of the government to get on with the job. It is with deep regret that earlier today I accepted the minister's resignation. I applaud their work over the last two months, and I'm very sorry that this small issue has dominated so much of their time. I'm delighted to welcome our new minister to the cabinet. I'm sure we've all forgotten that they had to resign in disgrace just a few weeks ago, and I'm looking forward to seeing them getting on with the job. No, I haven't seen that story, but today I'm really focused on welcoming our new minister. Sorry, it's about this new minister. Oh, for f oh, lovable scruff, lovable scruff. Get Brexit done, get Brexit done. <clears throat> uh, uh, look, uh, if you want an interview, I'll, I'll happily talk to you. I'm using happily in the Latin sense there, absolutely furious. I, 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 look, this, this whole thing is nonsense from beginning to end, uh, but enough about my career. No, Boris, come on, this is serious. No more Mr. Nice Boris, come on. Look, I think it's ridiculous that uh, elements of my diary were, were, were cherry-picked uh, and sent to the police or the Privileges Committee. Uh, I, I mean, there are, there are tens of thousands of entries in, in these things and, and literally hundreds that weren't breaking the rules. Look, no rules were broken. Uh, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again, no rules were broken. And yes, I know when I said it before, it turned out that I was lying, but this time I'm not lying. And that's not a lie. No, no, it's fine. Let him speak. He's from Sky News. You know, he's entitled to ask me questions. Although I have to say, where the hell is GB News when you need them? Look, they didn't even have the common sense to check with me. None of those entries constituted socialism. Socialising. Yep, that too. When I wrote in my diary, party with the lads, woo-hoo, it's going to be off the hook, that was actually code for important ministerial meetings. I find it extraordinary that these things were handed over by, I don't know, some sort of authority. I don't know, someone in the cabinet office or, I don't know, <clears throat> Rishi. Well, I, I think it's been a cock-up, a cover-up, uh, and now a stitch-up. Uh, but the one thing I can assure you of is that I will never shut up. Now, look, sorry, I really have to go. I'm flying to do a, a, another extremely well-paid speech for some Americans to tell them exactly how great I am. Uh, I, I'd also talk about Ukraine or something. But actually, before that, I need to pick up a few souvenirs for my kids, which will cost me approximately half my fee. Is there any way you could shoot him? We're in an airport. So, Minister, are you going to hand over all of the documents to the COVID inquiry? Look, it's important that we learn all of the lessons from COVID and ensure that all of the lessons that can be learned are learned. Yes, but in fact, we'll even try and learn all of the lessons that can't be learned in case they turn out to be lessons that can be learned, because we're keen to learn all of the lessons, as long as they can be learned, right? We just love learning lessons. OK, but will you hand over all of the documents? We've already handed over tens of thousands of documents to the inquiry in a spirit of transparency and candour. Yes, but what about the documents they're specifically asking for? We've handed over tens and tens of thousands of documents. OK, but tens and tens and tens of thousands of documents. Imagine a whole pile of documents, loads more than that. In fact, a whole room full, 10,000 rooms full. Yes, but tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of documents. Documents. Letters, emails, notebooks, post-its. 
takeaway menus, wine lists, receipts for fridges, instructions on how to mend a swing, bills for briefing rooms. Okay, but all we want to do is not hand over a few hundred possibly not even incriminating or embarrassing messages eh? in a spirit of transparency and candour. Because look, tens of thousands versus hundreds. Come on. Are you prepared to get into a legal battle over this? The government is carefully considering its position, but is confident in the approach it has taken. So you are willing to go to court? The government is carefully considering its next steps, but is confident in the position it has taken. Are you just going to keep repeating what you just said? My position is considerately confident, and we're approaching the next steps with carefulness. So you're not going to release the documents? We're approaching this in a spirit of transparency and candour, but also clearness and honesty and integrity and see-throughness. Are you reading that from a thesaurus? No, I think you'll find on that I am completely translucent. Why are you trying to keep hold of these documents? We're talking about private messages from the former Prime Minister. It's sensitive material. Can you give me an example? Well, when he sent a WhatsApp saying F me, it's not clear whether that was an instruction to his lover or his reaction on seeing the latest Covid death figures after eat out to help out. Thank you, Minister. Probably both, to be honest. Next up, as Al Pacino announces he's expecting his fourth child at the age of 83, we ask, when was the last time you started a project with absolutely no intention of seeing it through? I wrote my uh, Why I'm Leaving Parliament statement for The Spectator, but uh, apparently not everybody reads The Spectator these days. Well, well, let me tell you, they did when I was editor. Uh, uh, things have gone downhill since I left, which has become rather a pattern. So apparently I need to do this video version when all I really want is to be left alone with my loved ones, the other MPs who resigned this week. They are brave, brave people. I, I will never forget the names of Nadine, Doris, and um, another M, uh, Nick, Nigel. I will never forget Nigel, Nigel. But look, this is serious. I've been forced out by a vast conspiracy. I would use the word blob, but some would just use that as an opportunity to make a crack about my physique. The lefties, the remainers, uh, above all the women, uh, 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 Sue Gray, Harriet Harman, uh, Rishi Sunak, who've all tried to drag me down to their level. They're jealous of my masculine vitality and would do anything to reverse my beloved Brexit. Uh, which we all know has been a great success already and could be an even greater success. And if you'd only let me stay in Parliament, I could have explained exactly how successful it could have been. But now you'll never know. I, I, I mean, this whole Partygate thing has been nonsense on stilts from the beginning. I, I could never knowingly or recklessly mislead anyone because that would mean I could distinguish in my own mind between things that are true and false. And that is simply not how my mind works. I have been an MP since 2001. I take my responsibilities seriously. And I have also always had a laser focus on my constituency. Well, apart from the fact I was also London Mayor for a bit of time in between. I also was an MP for a different constituency. But apart from that, laser focused on my constituency. Why has the government abandoned signing a trade deal with the US? If I was still Prime Minister, we'd have signed two trade deals. One real one, one just for fun. I am extremely proud of all of my achievements in office, which I don't have to go into here. Kidding. Brexit. Ukraine. Vaccines. All the hits. I'm very sad to be leaving Parliament. For now. Let's just say, maybe I'll return in the future as the leader of a new party. As long as that doesn't involve any work. But for now, let's just say, I'll be back. Uh, no, I've done that already, haven't I? Okay. Hasta la vista. But, oh no, I did that one too. How many resignations do I have to do? Why won't people just let me rule them in peace? Okay, here's a sign off I haven't done yet. Why don't you all just fuck? Hi. Matt Hancock here, best known for coming third on I'm a Celebrity after a brief stint in frontline politics, and now I'm doing challenges on TikTok. I'm really happy with how my life is going. I'm going to rank five scandals in order of seriousness without knowing what's coming next. Partygate. <laughs> Obviously that's a big one. I brought down Boris Johnson in the end, but can I really put it number one when I don't know what's coming next? Nope, I'm going to put it number two because I'm an optimist uh, and I think there's something even bigger coming up. PPE procurement. Well, pff, it depends on which PPE, doesn't it? I mean, some of it works, some of it doesn't. Some of it comes from my mates, some of it doesn't. I'll put it at number three. Chris Pincher. I mean, you've really got to be in the mood. <laughs> and consenting, which is something he never really understood. I mean, it was, a, it was a big one, got Boris out of Downing Street, but there are so many scandals, hard to know what to do, isn't it? Uh, four. No testing in care homes. Well, that's just sad, isn't it? And I did nothing wrong. Don't think about my WhatsApps. Don't listen to Isabel Oakeshott. Wait for the inquiry. It's got to be number five. Ask 
grab. Oh, no. I can't believe that's definitely five and definitely not one. Oh, I can't believe how badly I've messed this up. You know, who'd think I'd be so bad at planning and prioritizing? You know, I didn't think this through like so much else. But I've only got one slot left. Arse grab at the top. That's what I'll be remembered for. <laughs> Great. The Privileges Committee report into Boris Johnson was published today with damning conclusions about the former Prime Minister. Our Smackdowns and Comeuppances correspondent Jonathan Goodenough has more. Yes, that's right. Never in the history of this Parliament, or perhaps any Parliament, in this world or perhaps any world, has such a damning report been published into a man or woman, but in this case definitely a man, who let's not forget just a few months ago was technically in charge of the country. So what's in the report? Well, it's 30,000 words long and was only just published, so I haven't had a chance to read all of it, obviously, but I think I've got the gist. And that is... Boris Johnson. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Can you give us any more detail? Well, I'm quite a slow reader and it was literally only published minutes ago, but I think in simple terms, lying, misleading and contempt. That sounds serious. Yes, so serious in fact that they would have recommended a 90 day suspension from the Commons, which is, let's not forget, nearly two whole Liz Truss terms. Has Johnson responded? Yes, he said that the whole process was nonsense and a sham, thereby committing even more contempt on top of the original contempt, leading to what some constitutional scholars have described as contempt cubed. So what happens now? Well, many observers are saying that this must be the very final nail in the coffin of Boris Johnson's political career. In fact, the committee even said that he shouldn't get a parliamentary pass, which will be devastating for someone who respected the Commons so much. So what will he do now? Well, it looks likely that he'll be forced to fall back on an existence of extremely well-paid speaking engagements and writing jobs, which sounds like an absolutely lovely life to me. But you have to remember that if this report has taught us anything, it's that Boris Johnson does not see the world like anybody else. We're now joined by Red Wall MP, Brandon Binday. It's absolutely revolting what's happened to our Boris. It's been brought down by the woke blob who've never forgiven him for Brexit. Four of the members of the committee were conservatives. Not real ones. They're snivelling traitors and they deserve to be whipped in the street. The committee has said that they will investigate any MPs attacking it as possibly also committing contempt of Parliament. Right, well, well, have they said that? Right, well, that's that's fine, because I've always said I respect them. You just called them snivelling traitors. No, I didn't. This is just the kind of witch hunt that brought down our great leader. You lot won't be happy until we're lying naked in a ditch being pelted with fruit. But who will pick that fruit? Like I've said before, unemployed people. Like Boris Johnson? It were like a candle in wind. Next up, as Nadine Doris delays resigning from her seat until she discovers exactly why she didn't get a peerage, we ask when was the last time you did something stupid whilst drunk, then just kept on doubling down. Our top story today, a person has thrown confetti at a wedding. Our shock, outrage and enormity correspondent, Jonathan Goodenough, has more. Yes, that's right. The former Chancellor, current media personality and future warning from history, George Osborne, was getting married to his former advisor, Thea Rogers, this weekend when something dreadful occurred. Are you talking about the poison pen email, which was widely shared beforehand? No, although I may be the only person who isn't. So what happened? Well, as the happy couple, one half of which was responsible for the austerity programme, estimated by one study to have killed over 300,000 people, and the other half, which was his advisor when he did it, emerged from the church, they were approached by an old lady who... I'm sorry. Take your time. She approached them and threw confetti at them. Jesus. It gets worse. It was orange confetti, which we all know is bad luck at a wedding. A fact that I've just made up. So was this a Just Stop Oil protest? Well, orange is very much their colour and they've applauded the action, but they've denied responsibility. This must have been very upsetting for the couple. Not just the couple, within minutes, high profile figures from across the media and the political spectrum told me that this basically terrorist action was completely unacceptable. How were you able to speak to them so quickly? Well, like me, they were all guests at the wedding. Yeah, sadly I had to work so I couldn't be there with you. But uh, I suppose the fact that I'm on air now means that I definitely can't be the centre of a different scandal. Indeed, but this shocking incident raises some devastating questions. Questions that the guests all pondered as they danced the night away. What sort of questions? What if instead of confetti it had been gunpowder or anthrax? And what if instead of a wedding it had been a funeral or maybe a life-saving operation where one single piece of confetti could be lethal? God. Or what if non-violent protests were the same as assassination attempts and acknowledging the difference between them was just too hard? Quite. Or what if they had to confront the fact that politics has consequences for real people's lives and isn't just a game played out on the pages of newspapers written by their actual friends? It just doesn't bear thinking about. One thing's for certain though, no one's talking about that other thing anymore. I literally don't know what you mean. Next up, as scientists recorded the hottest day in history last week, we ask, are you beach body ready? We pick out the latest swimwear trends that match best with a climate catastrophe. 
Hundreds of British holidaymakers have had their summers ruined by wildfires in Greece. Our delays, evacuations and Dunkirk spirit correspondent Jonathan Goodenough has more. Yes, that's right. As fires raged across the islands of Corfu and Rhodes today, destroying businesses and property presumably owned by Greek people, hundreds of British tourists have seen their holiday plans turn to ash. How are they responding? Well, with a mixture of shock and disappointment, but also with a big dose of good old-fashioned British spirit. You'd expect nothing less. Many people are asking why the British government didn't warn people not to come to an area devastated by fires, and also why holiday companies didn't warn British people that summer in Greece can be very hot. Quite. Yes, I spoke to one British holidaymaker who complained that having been evacuated from his hotel, he was having to spend the night in a sports hall. And yet, because of all of the makeshift beds, there was no space to play badminton. God. Another very distressed British woman told me that she had a massage booked for that evening, but she'd witnessed spa staff working as volunteer fire marshals and covered in ash, so was fairly sure that that massage was not going to take place. It's almost too much. However, one British couple did tell me that the help they'd received from Greek people, who'd recently seen large parts of their communities destroyed, had really restored their faith in human kindness. Although they did point out they still couldn't find a decent cup of tea. <laughs> Lovely. Do we know why the fires have been so destructive this year? Well, there are a number of factors, including climate change, of course, but I think it's fair to say that none of the British people here want to think about any of that right now. No, presumably they just want to go home. Yes, and then they want to get straight back onto a plane somewhere hot. Just not that hot. So, in a week where the government appears to be watering down its commitment to net zero, should we be- Sorry, sorry, hang on. I'm just getting word that another large hotel has been surrounded by fire, and there are fears that not everyone has made it out safely. Oh no, are any British people involved? Actually, I'm hearing that it's mainly frequented by French and German tourists, as well as the mostly Greek staff, so, uh, well, nothing to worry about. <laughs> Sorry to be so dramatic. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. Next up, as the BBC apologises to Nigel Farage for the coverage of the closure of his bank account, saying that, quotes, they made a mistake after being given incomplete and inaccurate information, we ask, is that also a good description of Brexit? And if so, when will Mr Farage apologise to us? This government is the single biggest challenge facing this country at the moment. With this government, what you buy is more expensive and what you save is worth less. And in the end, this government puts your jobs and livelihoods at risk. But while this government has got worse since I became Prime Minister, which is incredible when you think about where I started from, dragging it out remains my top priority for this year and next year. Because you never know, something might come up to save this government. We know this government is causing people distress and anxiety, but the alternative is much worse. Without decisive action to retain this government, people who once stood with Jeremy Corbyn could get into power, and living standards might increase in the long run. That cannot be allowed to happen. I believe that we can't make a positive case to retain this government, and because of that, I need to make some difficult decisions. Decisions like accusing Labour of being funded by Just Stop Oil, and loving criminal gangs, and hating women. Tough decisions like granting hundreds of new gas and oil licences, because this government believes that spoiling the past isn't enough if you can't also ruin the future. Strong choices like shoving migrants into floating fire traps, because we know that that's something that some people want from this government. Because this government won't take lectures from anyone, which is why we're shutting down several degree courses. So look, I know a lot of brain owners will be worried about this government, but why not take your mind off things by delivering a few takeaways, or playing chess outside, or even popping to Disneyland? But don't go there by private jet, that's only for journeys you could have done by train. Because I have a plan for this government, and that's to stay in government regardless of the pain you're feeling. There's still a long way to go, but we're sticking to the plan, because the plan is working, even if I'm not. So, Minister, the government announced that this is Crime Week. Does that mean you've been committing crimes? Ha! Huh, no. Not this time. So what have you been doing? Well, we've made zombie knives illegal. Yes, in fact, you tweeted a picture of yourself holding one of those next to three policemen, looking like you've just been arrested for trick-or-treating. Yes, those dangerous knives will now be made... illegal. Are they not already illegal? They are now going to be super illegal. What does that mean? 
it means I get to take a photo with some policeman. Like the most Tory Make-A-Wish Foundation request ever. We're also making it easier to get rid of bad police officers. They'll face immediate dismissal if found guilty of gross misconduct. Does that include posing for photographs with politicians? No, just checking. I also want to make it clear that if you look at the crime data, obviously there are still some challenges, but overall the level of crime is now nearly half what it was in 2010. But that's only if you don't include fraud and computer crime. If you include those, crime has actually gone up. Well, uh, no, crime is down 54%, but only if you don't include fraud, which if you think about it, is a kind of fraud, isn't it? Well, no. Should I report this conversation as a crime? Uh, no point, I suppose, as you just wouldn't count it as one. No, look, we are now telling police to investigate all crimes. Lucky us. We are clear that there is no such thing as a minor crime. Does that include vandalism and property damage? Of course, that kind of crime can be very distressing and must be thoroughly investigated. Even when it's damaging a camera for you, Les? Well, uh, well, that, that's just people making a legitimate political protest. Like, just stop oil? I'm sorry, you're breaking up, Minister. I, uh, uh, can't hear you. You're froze. Thank you, Minister. Next up, we speak to the schools minister who said this week that all children must go to school even when they're ill, unless it's one of the schools that might collapse because of crumbling concrete, and ask him, is he one of the worst politicians, not just in the world, but in the UK? Are you proud of what you achieved during the war, even though you were born well after 1945? Do you think that kids have it too easy these days with their phones and video games and nice hot summers? Or are you about 34 and wish you'd been around to cheer on the police during the miners' strike? Then you'll love Great British National Service. Our research shows that kids these days are unhappy, unmoored and always making a racket in the shopping centre. They say they want to tackle the climate crisis, the economic and political systems making them powerless, and the general sense that they have no future. But we all know that what they really need is to forget all that and run around in a field for a bit. What better way to foster national unity than to force our teenagers to do something that helps the rest of us, like lockdown but outside? They'll learn crucial life lessons like why it's still really important to buy newspapers, how to watch Great British News, and when to leave a passive-aggressive comment on nextdoor.com. Who needs immigration when we can get our 16-year-olds to pick fruit and vegetables, repair crumbling schools, help small businesses with export paperwork, run food banks, and clean barges for migrants. With any luck, they'll be so happy and tired from working for free, they won't have the energy to vote. Does this sound complicated and expensive? Don't worry, we'll get the private sector to organise it. They love a big project. And best of all, they're our mates. But how will we pay for it? Well, we could change the pension triple lock to release a bit of money for young people. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> had you going there, didn't I? Uh, we'd never do that, we're not stupid. We know who votes for us. Um, no, we'll just put a tax on them. Uh, Playstations or vapes or school meals or something. Great British National Service, because it never would have done you any harm. And if you like this, you'll love our next campaign. Bring back Great British Hanging. Hi, I'm a government minister. I know some of you are worried about what's happening at the moment, but I'm here with my nice, calm voice and artful, soft focus background to reassure you that everything's going to be fine as long as we can work out how to turn this music off. You probably thought this was a backing track that some intern had put over the top of this video so that we look cool and edgy, or even so some broadcasters can't clip it and play it on the news. But no, ever since Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, every government department has been struggling with this. We think perhaps Liz Truss forgot to turn something off and now we can't find the switch. You might think the government's been doing badly, but I think we've been doing a pretty fucking good job considering this racket's on all the time. It's very hard to concentrate. But does anyone give us any credit? No. <clears throat> we have learned it seems to get louder depending on the severity of the issue. So at the moment it's barely audible, but as I start talking about school buildings that are crumbling, then it gets quite hard to hear myself think. And can you see why we've stopped talking about the benefits of Brexit? It's really bad. It's got to the point where everything we put online makes us look like a culty Instagram lifestyle guru. 
trying to sell you snake oil supplements. But then the one time I tried making a TikTok friendly my 5 to 9 before my 9 to 5 routine, the soundtrack was just a single ringing bell. I can assure you we're working on a solution, but unfortunately we sacked all of the sound engineers during austerity and it's been quite hard finding any more to recruit because of Brexit. Oh, oh god, no, no, it's happening again! We in government would like to make it clear that most schools are unaffected by the crumbly concrete issue, most children are completely safe and most parents have nothing to worry about. In fact, it's only about 5% of schools that are affected, and when you think about it like that, it's basically just a rounding error. I'd just like to stress that most of the water in our rivers and seas is not actually sewage. Most of the water is unaffected by the sewage that's floating in it, and most people don't want to swim in the sea, or in rivers. So... It's important to note that most buses are not primed to explode if their speed falls below 50 miles an hour. Yes, the government has been aware of the existence of these buses for some time, but most of the people we care about don't use buses. I know that people on board the vessel are worried, but can I make it clear that most ocean-going liners are unaffected by icebergs? I can't stress this enough. Most asteroids are not hurtling towards this planet, threatening to wipe out all life on Earth. In fact, most asteroids go about their business without causing any worldwide panic at all, so maybe we should be giving a bit more thought to them. I accept that this has been a difficult election night for us, but can I just point out that some Tory MPs have kept their seats. They were the greatest of foes and each other's nemesis. Watson, this horrific crime bears all the hallmarks of my greatest enemy, Moriarty. You foiled my plots for the last time, Holmes. When next we meet, only one of us will walk away. But now they've been brought together in their most compelling adventure yet. A podcast. So what's been happening in crime this week? I've got a very good question from a listener here. Mrs. Hudson all Strad. Good one. Uh, I suppose it depends on what else is on the desert island. Contrary to popular belief, I'm not actually Irish, although I do enjoy a good Guinness. Who doesn't? Sure, my enormous criminal enterprise may have led to a few deaths, but who's to say they wouldn't have died anyway? Hmm. Hmm. Let me just push back on that gently. Very good, very good. What about criminals these days, though? No sense of style or class. And don't get me started on the detectives, eh? I bet none of them could write a best-selling book. Uh, ten best-selling books, but uh, who's counting? Touché. You know, I was quite angry with you at the time, but uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I can sort of see you had a bit of a point. Hmm, ditto. Did you really think you'd get away with that one? Well, I'm sitting here chatting to you and not in jail, so in a way I did, didn't I? <laughs> ha. Okay, that's our time. I think we'll have to leave it there. See you next week. Love you, Daddy. What? Nothing. The Labour leader Keir Starmer was in Europe today, where he outlined his plans on immigration. Our tough talk, big plans and harsh rhetoric correspondent, Jonathan Goodenough, has more. Yes, that's right, the Labour leader was in The Hague today, although not facing war crimes charges, something that many members of his party think that his predecessor should do. You're talking about Tony Blair. Always. But Starmer was at Europol today, where he described people smuggling as as big a threat to the UK as climate change, terrorism and Scottish independence. Did you make that last one up? Yes. Strong words from the Labour leader there. What's his actual plan? Uh, something about a better relationship with the EU. How would you describe the current government's relationship with the EU? Have you seen the TV show The Nightmare Neighbour Next Door? No, but I hate the title. Not as much as this government hates the EU. So what would Starmer's better relationship involve? Intelligence sharing, scrapping the Rwanda deal, and getting back to some sort of EU-wide return scheme. And might that include the UK taking in a number of refugees from Europe? In theory, yes. What's been the government's response? In essence, they've accused Starmer of being a big softy who, if he loves refugees so much, should probably marry one. I'm paraphrasing. A bit. Yes, in fact, earlier Suella Bravman, the Home Secretary, tweeted that Labour would make this country a dumping ground for migrants. Whereas presumably she wants to keep this country as a dumping ground for sewage and national conservatism. Any other reaction? Yes, the Conservative Party, including Rishi Sunak, have just said that Labour's plans would mean 100,000 more migrants every year. Where did they get that number from? It seems they picked the biggest number they thought they could get away with and hoped that reporters like me would simply repeat it uncritically. And has that worked? Yes. So immigration will be a big issue at the next election. Yes, that's right. Both major parties are trying to look tough when dealing with people they call illegal immigrants, but who might be more accurately described as asylum seekers who haven't had their claims processed yet. 
And what about them? What about who? The asylum seekers. Uh, we've got footage of some arriving on a small boat. And what did they say? Oh, I didn't take the footage. I think it came from Nigel Farage. Have you spoken to any actual asylum seekers for this report? No, but I did think about them for a bit, and that made me sad. Thank you, Jonathan. Next up, as Rishi Sunak blames industrial action for record NHS waiting lists, we ask, when was the last time you tried to use an excuse that actually made you look worse? Conference, we need to stand up and fight for our right to party with Nigel Farage. Thank you for that lovely introduction from my wife. Uh, it reminded me why I was first attracted to her, billionaire family. Three cheers for GB News. One for every presenter they've sacked this week. We know who's really in charge, and it's not us. Do you think things would be in such a mess if we had anything to do with it? We know who's really to blame, and his name rhymes with J Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. I won't take lectures from people for whom spending thousands of pounds means nothing, because why would I take lectures from myself? I'm not afraid to tell you the truth. Disabled people, just pretending. Trans people, just pretending. Asylum seekers, just pretending. Now, some people would say that saying that makes me a bad person, but I don't care because those people live in ivory towers with luxury beliefs, whereas I live in the gutter with the real people of this country. We need to take the concerns of renters seriously because, look, not all renters smoke drugs or are in gangs, you know? I mean, for goodness sake, my children both rent from me. And yes, they are a bad example because they both smoke drugs and are in a gang, but the point still stands. Labour want to ban meat, outlaw driving, replace teachers with drag queens, policemen with people smugglers, and most of all, they want to replace midsummer murders with naked attraction. I've taken the bold decision to cancel one big infrastructure project and replace it with loads of small infrastructure projects that won't happen. We're bringing new transport projects to the north. For the very first time, you'll be able to take a train to Leeds, or a bus to Bradford, or even drive to Hull. None of this would be possible under Sir Keir Starmer. We're going to reform education by replacing the A and T levels with the advanced British standard. So advanced, it won't be here for about a decade, by which time I'll be in charge of TikTok or something. You know, I want to be able to look around my town centre and not think it looks like a foreign country. And no, I don't think that makes me xenophobic. I'm not scared of monks. We need to stand up and fight. I mean, seriously, does anyone want to fight? I've got a sword. Above all, this country knows that it is time for a change. And we are sh We can do all this because I'm stopping all phases of HS2 beyond Birmingham. Okay, and they're just uh, editing some jump cuts and some banging house music as usual and we'll be done. And remember, don't tell anyone about this until after conference. You know, otherwise we'll spend all week talking about it. And everyone will know I was lying when I said I hadn't made a decision yet. Actually, we've got a bit of time. Um, maybe we should bash out a few more of these for the future. You know, save us setting all the cameras again. Yeah? Okay, um, and that's why with a heavy heart and after listening to all of the debate and conversation over the last few weeks, I've decided to withdraw this country from the European Court of Human Rights and instead replace it with a great British Court of Human Rights. Brackets, but not for those people. Close brackets. Okay, what else? Uh, Oh, many congratulations to England for winning the World Cup. Your opponents didn't stand a chance, and you played some excellent rugby. And you played some excellent cricket. And you played some excellent netball. Just use whichever one we need. Still got some time? Okay, a few more. We all know the real scourge affecting this country, and that's why I've decided to ban everything woke. In fact, we'll increase the age at which people can buy The Guardian by one year every year. Yeah, okay. When I took on this job, I didn't expect to have to invade France. But they haven't stopped the boats, so I'm afraid we have no choice. This is fun, isn't it? I have sent word to the alien mothership currently hovering above London that I am prepared to talk, as long as they don't try to get us to reverse Brexit. Just one more. I am delighted by these results and honoured to be re-elected as your Prime Minister for the next five Yeah, Don't worry about that. We can only do stuff that might actually happen. The Covid inquiry continues this week with testimony from some of Boris Johnson's closest aides. Viewers are warned that this report contains people that some of you might find offensive. 
Our disgusting orgy of narcissism correspondent, Jonathan Goodenough, has more. Yes, that's right. The inquiry heard today from former Press Secretary Lee Kane and former advisor Dominic Cummings, who described ministers as morons, liars and useless. Useless what? Well, I, I don't want to say. He didn't just call them useless, he called them useless. My mum watches this. He called them useless. Fuck pigs. Louder. Fuck pigs. Thank you. He also called them Carry on. <clears throat> right, the day started with testimony from Lee Kane, who said that Covid was the wrong crisis for Boris Johnson's skill set. Did he say what would have been the right crisis? Well, the general consensus is that the right crisis for his skill set would have involved an after-dinner speech, a model of a bus, and a woman who absolutely had to get pregnant. Right. We've also seen notes and whatsapps from the former Prime Minister in which he agreed that Covid was nature's way of dealing with old people, and even suggested that people with Covid lived longer, suggesting he understands statistics about as well as he does marriage vows. What else did the former Prime Minister say about old people? He was apparently obsessed with old people accepting their fate and allowing young people to just get on with their lives, which seems like a rather cavalier approach to your own voter base. He came in for a lot of criticism, didn't he? Yes, that's right, Dominic Cummings made it clear that he thought that Boris Johnson was completely unsuitable for the role of Prime Minister, and yet he worked hard to get him elected. Yes, and when challenged on that, he said that if Boris Johnson hadn't been elected, Brexit would have been in danger, and he couldn't let that happen. Well, at least that's been a huge success. Quite. Cummings then went on to describe a government in chaos with no plans to deal with the pandemic in truly shocking testimony that was it though? Sorry? Shocking. Was anybody actually shocked? Well, I mean, wasn't it patently obvious from the beginning that Boris Johnson's government was as suited to dealing with a crisis like Covid as Mary Berry would be at knocking out Tyson Fury? Actually, based on his performance this weekend, she might take a round off him. Fair point. But isn't calling all of this shocking a form of gaslighting? Pretending we didn't know it was all a shambles all along? Well, we didn't know what they were calling each other in private. And what was that? Useless fuckpigs. And c***s. Thank you, Jonathan. Sorry, Mum. Next up, as it's rumoured that Nigel Farage might be sent into the jungle, we ask, how disappointing is it to find out it's just for a TV show? As Rishi Sunak shakes up his team, I'm joined by the Right Honourable Jeffrey Jeff Jeffrey. Do you enjoy a reshuffle? Absolutely, it gets the blood pumping, the adrenaline going. I mean, without regular reshuffles, you end up with ministers who know what they're talking about, which simply is not how we do things in this country. So, Swella Bravman is gone. Just last week you said you would back her all the way. Do you stand by that? What I meant was that I would back her all the way out of the door. So you're glad she's gone? Look, Suella is a skilled politician who simply needs to learn the difference between a dog whistle and incitement. You think she said the quiet part out loud? More like screamed it through a megaphone, then scrawled it in the Times. Uh, but like all good villains, she'll be back. Did you say villains? No, women. Right, we're hearing some speculation that David Cameron could return to Cabinet. <laughs> oh, very funny. I mean, only last month Rishi said he was the change candidate and was breaking with the old consensus. He's hardly likely to bring back an old Prime Minister who's not even an MP. Well, I've just received confirmation that David Cameron has been made Foreign Secretary and been made a baron. It's an excellent move and shows the Prime Minister's maturity and confidence. Foreign Secretary is a tough job right now, although I suppose even if David Cameron resigned tomorrow, he'd still be in the Lords for life. But it wouldn't be like David Cameron to walk away when the going gets tough. You've been a minister yourself, of course. Many times. Sometimes for as long as a month. So can you tell us how a reshuffle works? Well, you get a WhatsApp from number 10 asking for a quick chat. If they want you to come in the front door, that's good news. The back door, less so. At this point, I'm tempted to make a rude joke. Wasn't that one of the reasons you had to resign? Yes, it turns out that Tinder DMs are not off the record. So there will be MPs all across Westminster anxiously waiting for that notification? Absolutely, and you never know when it... Oh my god! Good news? I'll say. My local takeaway is having a sale. Oh, we're just hearing that Esther McVeigh is heading into Cabinet. What? What job is she doing? Uh, it's being described as Minister for Common Sense and Against Wokeness. Oh, come on, that's not fair. I suggested that to Rishi last week. As a joke. Did he laugh? Does he ever? Thank you. Uh, minister? No. Yes! Two for one on selected pizzas. Next up, as the government appoints its 16th housing minister in 10 years, we ask, when was the last time you pretended to care about something but kept putting it at the bottom of your to-do list? The autumn statement has been greeted with delight by many of the papers declaring that taxes are coming down, if you squint. Our Reconomics, three-card trick and sleight-of-hand correspondent Jonathan Goodenough has more. Yes, that's right. Mr Hunt, the Chancellor and most powerful Jeremy in the UK, announced a series of measures that he said will reduce the tax burden if you don't look too hard. And if you do look hard? You'd have to bear in mind the effects of inflation, which is leading to huge fiscal drag. What is huge fiscal drag? Well, apart from my stage name on a Friday night, 
It's when rising wages and static tax bans mean that many people are dragged into paying more to the Exchequer. So the government is giving with one hand and taking away with the other? It's very much their favourite move. I guess you could call it a fiscal grab. So if taxes are actually higher, does that mean they're spending more on public services? God no. Inflation means they're also deciding to make big cuts. So they're putting up taxes whilst saying they're not, and cutting public services whilst saying they won't. Fun, isn't it? So according to the Chancellor, working people are the winners from this statement. So who are the losers? You mean apart from people who believe in honesty and political communication? Apart from them, yes. The long-term sick and disabled have been told it's their duty to work from home. Otherwise their benefits will be removed. So working from home is now a good thing? Only if you're long-term sick and disabled. Otherwise the message is very much, get back to the office, you wastrels. So will forcing these people into work recoup a lot of money? Not really, but it will give their voters someone else to be angry about. Which is always handy. Hang on, wasn't the increase in working from home recently used as an excuse for not investing more in the railways? Absolutely. The government has been clear that working from home is a bad thing which changes everything. Except when it isn't, and it doesn't. Sounds like more chicanery. But only if you're paying attention. Thank you, Jonathan. Next up, as the COVID inquiry hears evidence that Rishi Sunak said that the government should just let people die, and that Boris Johnson didn't understand simple graphs, we ask, when was the last time you were promoted way above your ability, and how many people were killed because you just tried to busk it? Are you feeling weighed down by all of your old messages? Did you have IT lessons but weren't completely paying attention for some reason? I say. Do you plan to work in Silicon Valley soon, but also want to pretend that you have the same phone skills as the average grandparent, the ones you didn't kill? Then you need Tory Tech. Just hand all of your devices to us, and our top team of Tory Techs will replace them with brand new versions, without all of that annoying, incriminating evidence. WhatsApps full of chilling remarks about the people you were supposed to protect, Tory Tech can wipe those clean so you can I don't recall to your heart's content. Threads that show you were fighting like particularly thick rats in a particularly stupid sack? Tory Tech will get rid of them so you can pretend you were basically Churchill crossed with Nelson. Challenged by an inquiry to produce evidence that you're legally obligated to provide, Tory Tech will give you the perfect get out. You simply changed your phone numerous times in recent years and everything that was stored in the cloud has now turned to rain and you can't read rain, can you? Tory tech, because instead of a paper trail, sometimes it's better to have a clean slate, especially if the old slate is covered in swear words. Order today and we'll throw in our five random pledges generator, because you never know when you'll need to replace the promises you broke with a quintet of vague new commitments. Warning, for best results, Tory tech must be installed by everyone you send messages to. May not work with scientists. If you give all of your WhatsApps to a right-wing journalist notorious for betraying secrets, we really can't help you. Rishi Sunak avoided defeat in the House of Commons last night, but his troubles are far from over. Our face-punching, foot-shooting and self-inflicted crisis correspondent, Jonathan Goodenough, has more. Yes, that's right, the Safety of Rwanda bill passed its second reading last night, presumably soon to be followed by a Tallness of Sunak bill, a Brilliance of Hunt bill, and a Everybody Really Loves the Government, Don't They bill. So what happened to the promised rebellion? It's a complex picture featuring Tory MPs in various groupings, including the European Research Group, the Northern Research Group, the Common Sense Group, the Southern Gut Feelings Gang, and the National Conservative Common Sense Seen on Wikipedia Absolute Lads Collective. And Marc Francois is back. Yes, with his crack team of lawyers that call themselves the Star Chamber, better known to their friends as the Bigot Nook. All of this seems quite reminiscent of the Brexit debate back in 2018. Well yes, that's because the entire country has been in the grip of a Conservative Party psychodrama for well over a decade now, where every decision has to be approved by the most extreme people in public life. In what sense? Well, at the moment, all of the arguments are between those on the right of the party and the further right of the party, with the occasional intervention from someone who would describe themselves as one nation, but who is in fact just slightly less right-wing. What about those on the left of the party? They're mostly doing podcasts now. I see. So you have people on the right demanding an immigration system that is tighter, harder, and full fat, like a particularly angry cheddar. Okay. And those on the slightly less right suggesting something softer, looser, and more semi-skimmed. Like a brie? Indeed, but it's a bit like the argument between a soft and a hard Brexit. In the end, hard will always win, because who wants to vote for something soft? And after all, brie is French. Coming back to the vote, the government really pulled out all of the stops, didn't they? Yes, that's right, a minister was flown back from COP28 in an act of climate hypocrisy that must have really pleased the hosts in Dubai, and five independent MPs who are currently suspended from the Conservative whip also voted yes. 
Have they been suspended for fun reasons? Not really. So the ethically suspect are allowed to vote on the lives of the desperate. Isn't parliamentary democracy great? Thank you, Jonathan. Next up, as Christmas approaches, we discuss the most energetic party games you can play with your family this year, so you can all get nice and warm and don't have to put the heating on. No, I don't think I'm tetchy. I, I, I don't know where this has come from. I, I'm not tetchy. I'm just passionate about what I believe in. What do you mean I sound like an apprentice candidate? What I believe in is sending some random asylum seekers to Rwanda, because it's a gimmick that one of my many predecessors came up with and... Well, I don't have any better ideas. I've actually been Prime Minister for over a year now, which is actually quite a big achievement, right? No, I'm not angry or upset or tetchy. Oh, Keir made a joke, did he? Yeah, yeah, I bet it was a funny one. <laughs> no, I, I did understand it. Yeah, I did, once it was explained to me. Yeah. Of course I'm fine. You know, think about my life. I've always been top of my class, uh, successful, rich, yeah. unlike some Prime Ministers. All I'm saying is that, you know, being PM, it's, it's actually quite hard sometimes. Maybe, sometimes, a thank you would be nice. I mean, what does tetchy even mean? I don't recall being called tetchy before. Actually, let me... Nope, I don't recall it. They're saying I'm as unpopular as Liz Truss. I mean, come on, that can't be right. Of course I've made progress. Did I stop the boats? No. Do I wish I hadn't used the word stop and instead something like reduce? No, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm fine with it. I'm not tetchy. Sorry, who was it who called me tetchy? No reason, no reason. I'm just interested. It's interesting, isn't it? And the police have got a few new powers they haven't used yet. Could you say that insulting a prime minister is terrorism? In a way. I mean, it's arguable, isn't it? I mean, don't ask the BBC. <laughs> don't make me tetchy. You wouldn't like me when I'm tetchy. <laughs> but seriously, I'm not tetchy. Do you think they meant titchy? Because, I mean, then that is, that is unfair. That is an unfair crack about my height. And I think I'd be well within my rights to be quite upset. That, no, it was, it was tetchy. It was definitely tetchy. Right, okay, okay, okay that's fine. Because I'm not that. Christmas? Well, I suppose it would be nice to have a bit of a break, won't it, with the family? Get away from all of my loyal MPs going around backstabbing everywhere. <laughs> Apparently there's a new lot I have to worry about now, the Conservative Common Sense Research Group. wonder where they're doing their research. Local weather spoons? <laughs> no, I'm not, not that I'm saying there's anything... I've never been to one myself, but, but I imagine there. And I'll probably have another by-election to deal with, and that's, that's fine. I'm looking forward to that, because one of my MPs is corrupt, apparently. And that's fine. It's good. Bring it on. I love a by-election. There's nothing else I'd rather do. It's not like there's anything else important on my desk. <laughs> I wonder if Elon's got time for another chat. I mean, he can be tetchy. Is this tetchy enough for you? Hello, it's me, that guy you've seen being funny about politics on the internet. You might have also seen me on Late Night Mash or Doctor Who. You might have heard me in a podcast like Oh God What Now or Paper Cuts or Rahulastapa. You might have seen me in a comedy club or even just seen me walking down the street. In which case, back off. Now, I'm taking my stand-up show on tour in 2024, following sell-out shows at the Brighton, Camden and Edinburgh Fringe Festivals. Some of the tour venues have already sold out, some have just got a few tickets left, so grab yours now before they all go. Uh, they'd make an excellent present for anybody in your life who's a fan of comedy or satire. Uh, and if but you don't could... worry, I'll be there as well. Yes, I'm the Right Honourable Geoffrey Jeff Geoffrey, Minister for something or other, and I'll be accompanying Matt on his tour to ensure some political balance and also to explain how we're going to win the next election. Or at least the one after that. Or the one after that. Book now! And remember, refunds are like the Elgin marbles. You can't have them. <laughs> We'll